I made a marvelous discovery today, an old reel of tape that I thought had been lost forever. An interview, one of three I did during my career, with Steve Allen, the original host of The Tonight Show. If you don't know who Steve Allen was, well, look him up. He was a Renaissance man, and it would take me far too long to tell you everything he did during his career. The first thing I wanted to ask Steve was the transition he made from radio to television, how that went. I was moving out of radio into television, which actually turned out to be a very easy transition, considering the uh, the two kinds of work I would eventually do in television, that being hosting talk shows, although as, always as a comedian, and secondly, doing primetime comedy sketch shows. Uh, the radio training was invaluable, and that applies not only to uh, my own experience, but uh, just to talk for a moment about the talk show field, there was the earlier generation of the talk show hosts, Johnny Carson, Jack Parr, myself, a few others, and we were all, uh, again, radio trained. It's not that we, we went into radio to, to prepare for television. The television hadn't even been invented when most of us got into radio, but it just turned out to, to have that uh, happy result. Whereas most of the talk show people now, the Leto, Letterman generation, uh, have had no experience whatever in radio. Uh, they come out of comedy clubs, and I don't think that's nearly as good preparation. First of all, they are surprisingly inarticulate, uh, d depending on how one, what one means by the term articulate. It's remarkable how rarely you hear an actual coherent English sentence these days uh, on, the, on television in general, but particularly the ad-lib portions. So uh, th there was that difference. But uh, there were some negatives, too, to the transition from radio to TV. Uh, in radio, as you know, as a practitioner of it, uh, silence is the background canvas on which uh, sounds are painted, so to speak. And they had big signs in, in radio studios, quiet, please, uh, shh, and <laughs> words to that general effect. Uh, whereas uh, nobody's ever bothered much about that in television settings. And uh, it was quite a shock for those of us who did comedy in radio where we had the advantage uh, of the early experience uh, in totally quiet surroundings, uh, the, the only sound you would hear outside the happy laughter of audiences, and there was that generally respectful attitude as regards just extraneous noise. Well, that changed abruptly as soon as we moved into television and, and began working in theaters with, with studio audiences. Uh, there were all kinds of distractions, none of which existed in, in the radio. At any moment, uh, the comedian or star, whoever it was, uh, would be speaking, uh, competing uh, with him for the attention of the studio audience. Might be 12 chorus girls over to the left of the stage about to prepare for a dance number. Three men pushing big pieces of machinery around on stage, two or three cameras, uh, one or two microphone dollies, those big rubber wheeled carts that they lug microphones on that are kept out of sight, of course and uh, announcers standing in the wings uh, laughing at or not uh, there's an awful lot going on and uh, finally of course we all adjusted to that and and now comedians can succeed despite those uh, problems but it did initially come as a shock you know you mentioned something there about radio i know i've had friends who watch me interview and they say well you always seem to have a question to ask and i think it's because having started in radio even though you, as you say silence is a necessary wonderful thing mm -hmm. there is this propensity though to have to put something in there now, if you're a comedian i guess it has to be funny but in the case of an interviewer it, it's it's deadly if i on this side of the mic seem the, a second of nothing seems an eternity for some reason yeah that, that that's an important factor uh, again, I don't have to instruct you because you're a very good and experienced interviewer, but uh, I've heard people say in response to my comment that almost anybody could host a Tonight-type talk show, television talk show, where you have 600 people present and you're supposed to entertain them as well as the viewers. They sometimes say, oh, no, the, you can't be right about that. I'd be terrified at, at interviewing people. I, I don't understand their terror. Uh, people are interviewing each other all over the world at this moment, saying things like, you know, brother, can you spare a dime? Or, hi, Bob, how's your sister? All kinds of questions. We ask people questions all day long. We don't get up out of bed and ask for the script for Thursday. We ad, ad lib from the time we're a year and a half old. So the ad living part of it is is uh, quite simple. And the, the secret of the good interviewers 
reminds me of, of my opinion that Merv Griffin was possibly the best interviewer of the well-known talk show hosts on, tel uh, on TV. And I think his secret, if you, if you want to call it that, was very simple. He listened to you. He also worked in close physical proximity to you. He had more fun, I think, doing his show after he got rid of the traditional desk. And uh, he, uh, he, he worked with the same prepared list of questions that all television staffs provide all TV talk show hosts. Uh, they find out uh, what the guest wants to plug, his new movie, his record album, his new marriage, whatever it might be he wants to talk about. And they uh, break that information up into five or six questions, and then they give those type list of questions, as you know, to uh, Jay Leno or David Letterman or Donald Duck or whoever they're working for. And uh, But of all the people who have ever used those, uh, I think Merv used them the least. And all he was doing was something that men have been doing or women have been doing for a million years. You just listen to the answers to your first few questions, and after that it's just like two guys having a conversation on a bus. When you left radio and went into television, did you see the camera as something that was easy to talk to? I mean, starting in radio, of course, radio, by its very essence, even with an audience, I think would feel more automatically one-to-one. -one. But was it difficult to get past the audience into the camera? No, it wasn't for me. Uh, first of all, I had a, an easy period before I was full-time employed in TV. I had been on it as a guest or a, an occasional participant uh, in a number of instances in the late uh, 1940s. So it, when I finally did it full-time, it wasn't suddenly jumping into cold water for the first time. It, I already felt comfortable with it. And then, too, I, I never have worked very differently uh, on TV. Than I, I'm just me anyway. I'm the only comedian in show business who does not have an act. I just find out how long I'm supposed to amuse or entertain, whatever. And I, I, I fill in my hour or my 90 minutes, and the people are nice enough to laugh, and they pay me, and I go home. So m my style was just accidentally well-suited for the, the casual kind of television. I refer to Arthur Godfrey and Dave Garraway. Young people today don't know their names. In fact, many young people today don't know the names of Thomas Jefferson <laughs> or Thomas Aquinas, for that matter. But nevertheless, they were very important in the 1950s. In fact, uh, Godfrey was more important than anybody ever has been since on television. He was uh, in your eyes and in your ears morning, noon, and night. At one time, he had three shows in the top ten, mm -hmm. and, and uh, either one or two of those shows were seen on television and at the same time uh, heard on radio. So, uh, But anyway, what distinguished uh, Arthur and what was similar to Garraway's work, although they were different, was the casual conversational approach. And neither knew how to act, neither was interested at all in acting. They were not performers. They would not have worked in nightclubs. That would have made no sense. But they were ideal for the casual, one viewer at a time at home uh, kind of thing that television was. Steve, who were your heroes in, in, in broadcasting as, as you were growing up? What did, what did you listen to at night? Well, uh, if you're talking about radio, uh, when I was a kid, I used to listen to... Uh, the great music that was then uh, commonly available, literally seven days a week uh, on the radio, um, one of the reasons that our country is in such cultural and general social trouble, uh, which is agreed to by every single thoughtful person, whether of the political right or the left, all races, all religions, all colors, every political and philosophical camp agrees that we're in a hell of a lot of trouble right now. And nothing that bad, nothing that serious could be occasioned by just one cause or just two or three causes. There are literally dozens of causative factors on the list accounting for our present sorry predicament. And one of them is the uh, almost total collapse of musical taste. Uh, now no one who's, let's say, 22 years old wants to hear this. They think, oh, there's an old man talking about the, the fact that he prefers his music. No, <laughs> you're missing the point if that is your reaction. And, and in fact, none of you may be guilty of so stupid a reaction, so forgive me for thinking you might be. Uh, to put the matter very concisely, Rhapsody in Blue is really better than Switchblade Baby, I'm going to stab you tonight. The music of the Golden Age, and it's rightly called the Golden Age, uh, was created by the greatest composers and greatest lyricists of the century. And one happy gleam in the surrounding darkness is that today's young songwriters concede that. They don't think they're better than uh, 
uh, Ira Gershwin or Cole Porter or Irving Berlin or Johnny Mercer at writing lyrics, they, they, all, they say, oh, no, man, we're not that good. We're working at it. But those men were giants, and we respect them. And the young composers today, they, not a one of them has ever claimed that he's one-tenth as good as Jerome Kern or, or George Gershwin or the other giants of that day. So we are talking, talking not just about a difference in generational taste, but a true and serious collapse uh, in quality. And uh, this has uh, a number of unfortunate effects, uh, some of which relate to uh, radio. So that's a, <laughs> a very long roundabout way of answering your question as to what I listened to. I listened to then great music, and it had a wonderful effect on me in my capacity as composer. My primary creative gift is for the composition of music. And it's obvious that all composers write in the style to which they are early exposed. That's one of the reasons today's music is getting steadily worse, because the 17-year-olds and 22-year-olds are not listening much to Gershwin, or for that matter, to Brahms or Beethoven. There are some of them who are, thank God, and they're very talented. But most kids are listening to musical garbage, and therefore they're producing musical garbage if they want to write songs. You're, you say your first love is music. Address yourself, if you will, not just to young people, but to parents about how important the discipline of that is, the, the entire envelope of music itself. Well, um, music is of such enormous importance, just to use the term in the broadest possible sense, that it doesn't require any defense on my part. Uh, probably, oh, I would think that 98% of the inhabitants of our planet are interested in some sort of music or other. We find it in primitive societies. We find it among, uh, at the other extreme, the most highly educated and sophisticated and uh, tasteful people. Um, but there is good and bad in, in all fields, whether you're talking about religion, ping pong, making custard pie, whatever it is, there are good custard pies and stupid, bad, ill-flavored custard, custard pies. So in music, you have the good and the bad. And uh, there are many instances now where a parent, let's say, who's 40, is trying to uh, influence the thinking and the musical taste of his 8- or 12-year-old or son or daughter. And it's a struggle, because you can bring home good albums and good CDs and uh, you know, control the TV a little bit, control the radio a little bit when you're with the children, but you're not with them all the time. And uh, therefore, uh, your good advice may... Uh, be swept away by the flood of garbage material to which they are usually daily exposed. Would it scare you to have a child now, small child, starting out again in the world we live in? Yes, uh, I have something like that experience because I have 14 grandchildren. Uh, most of them are scattered around the country, but uh, there are two, uh, well three now, there's a new little girl, who live just a few blocks from us, so I see them a few times every week, and I'm very sensitively aware of the difficulty of trying to keep children pure and innocent and uh, and informed. Um, the three kids are all adorable. I guess we're all born adorable. Hitler must have been adorable when he was one year old, so that doesn't add up to much. But uh, I have to constantly explain to the two boys, who are 10 and 8, that the purpose of their education in addition to the obvious, which is, you know, so they'll learn to count and multiply and speak grammatically and so, and so forth. The purpose of their education is so that at the end of it, they will be gentlemen. And at first, I think they just didn't understand what I meant by that, but I've been saying it to them for so many years now that they do indeed understand it. And I often hold up the standard of the gentleman to them when I hear them using vulgar language. They are not tough little, uh, uh, you know, rebellious kids. They're good kids. And they go to a good school, and their father is uh, comfortably fixed economically. They have many of life's blessings and forms of good luck. But the point is that even children in those fortunate circumstances are exposed partly because of radio, television, films, and recordings to uh, what may ultimately be an overwhelming barrage of misinformation and vulgarity and obscenity and uh, heartlessness and cruelty. So, to, again, to return to your question, yes, this particular time and place is one of the most difficult in history uh, if the ideal is to uh, produce children, to bring them, let's say, to the age of 15 or 16, and at the end of that process be able to point to them as, as bright and informed and civilized and uh, decent uh, to their uh, fellow humans. The other day in the shopping mall, a seven-year-old boy knocks me down, coming through, just knocks me on the floor. Hmm. 
I had broken my leg about a year ago, and I'm still a little afraid of falling. Mm. I say to him, you're excused. And his mother turns to me and says, why are you talking to my son? And I thought, boy, it's not just the child's fault. Oh, of course. Had she witnessed his yeah. running into you? Yeah. Yeah, just didn't, uh, it yeah. was my fault. I spoke to a stranger. <laughs> yeah. And he didn't say, oh, I'm sorry, no, Mr. No. Well, I, I, I should have said, I'm sorry, you know, your, your son's lack of tact shouldn't keep me from being in practice, but I didn't yeah. think to say that. <laughs> yeah, we all think of good lines after the people went home. Well, of, of course, most of the time when, when children really louse up, it, it, it's the, the parent's fault in one regard or another, sins of commission or omission. And it would appear that on the basis of admittedly scanty evidence, that woman has done very little to teach her son manners. And you do have to really work hard at that. I don't know how, I don't recall clearly how my generation happened to to learn manners. But it was parochial did. school. That was part of it, yeah. yeah. Uh, and even the public schools, too, were vastly more civilized than, than they are now. There were teachers who were good, decent human beings and, and incorporated instructions in manners. Today, the kids don't seem to be getting much. And as a result, you have problems with table manners and simple social deportment. And, and that's an example. You bump into somebody, you're supposed to say, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, or ouch, or something that indicates you're reacting like a, a thoughtful human being and not just, uh, just a, a rude machine. Steve, in the few minutes left, let's go back to music again. You were able, in your primetime shows and on The Tonight Show, to be, I think, more free form than the subsequent... I should never use that word. In, <laughs> the ensuing hosts of that program, because not that things would lag, but you had a lot of alternatives. If you wanted to, you could run over and play the piano. You, you, you could make up a song. I would think the the ability to write music must in a way be a magic that you can't explain that's true and you're very perceptive in realizing how unexplainable uh, the ability to create music is i don't mean simply to play the piano or, or play the violin that's nice but it's not essentially mysterious it's a mechanical skill but the ability to write music to create music or for that matter sculpture or painting or, or great drama is incredibly mysterious and not only to myself, not only to most folks, but to those who specialize in studying human motivations and the behavior of the brain. We really don't know why, out of any given 100 people, uh, if you gave all of them piano lessons, let's say, with the same teacher, if that were possible, and they all practice one hour a day for 10 years, at the end of that time, you'd probably have two really wonderfully gifted pianists, and you'd have... Uh, maybe 62, who could, you know, play piano at a party now and then, have a little fun and a couple of beers. And then you'd also have a remainder that, despite all that work and practice, were awful at the piano and never should have bothered about it in the first place. I think the primary factors involved in creativity are genetic. But that remark that I just made didn't clarify anything. It greatly deepened the mystery. Because what it means is, and I mean this in the most literal sense, some little smear of stuff that would look like a smear of tapioca in a glass dish. Let's really explain why Einstein could use his brain cells to do things, which is to say to conceive thoughts, that no one else was ever able to before his time, and damn few since his time, can even understand. Uh, and I think this applies in a perhaps simpler way to superiority of any sort. Steve, thank you very much. My pleasure. The wonderful Steve Allen. On a reel of tape I thought I'd lost. I'm Dennis Staley.